Okay. Hi, hi everybody. Welcome. Uh, uh, I'm uh, very proud, of course, to um, be with you today because I'm going to introduce Esan Sadalatnejad. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about him. Um, Esan was born in Brugerd, the province of Loristan, which is a mountainous region in the western part of Iran. He received his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Iran University of Science and Technology, and then a master's degree in uh, mechanical engineering from Sharif University, where he co-founded a startup company. He received a patent and uh, published five journal articles. Um, in his application to the BME PhD program here at Johns Hopkins, he wrote, I consider myself a good team leader and collaborator rather than a socially isolated genius. Um, I, I was struck by that sentence because at the time we were just starting to build a marmoset lab. And um, I very much needed somebody who would be a team leader and was hoping that uh, um, he would be that person. And he indeed had turned out to be exactly what we had hoped for, a team leader, a person that you could build a lab around. And uh, so I was delighted when he accepted our offer to come to Johns Hopkins. Um, what he did during his PhD is in two fields of neuroscience. In the field of behavioral neuroscience, he made two contributions. He discovered that reward prediction error, which is a driver of dopamine, invigorates movements. He discovered that by changing the cost of time, the brain can be allowed to learn more from prediction error. But his greatest contributions, I think, were in the field of neurophysiology. Um, he made three contributions in that field. First, he described how to train marmosets, target their cerebellum, maintain a healthy recording region in the brain for years. Now, I want to underline this because this was a really critical thing that we were able to accomplish. Before our work, the marmoset was an animal that was trained if there was a behavior associated with it and then recorded for a few weeks. What we were able to do with Esson's leadership was to change the recording procedure so that that animal's region where we were recording from remained healthy for years. And this was an order of magnitude change in the, um, uh, the process by which data could be recorded. He then led the effort to make an algorithm, a computational tool that made accurate analysis of neurophysiological data from the cerebellum possible. There was no tool specifically made for analysis of the data, and he made that tool. And finally, he put it together. He applied these findings to record from the marmoset cerebellum and discovered something marvelous. Purkinje cells synchronize their spikes to control movements. And he's going to tell you all about this. Now, um, it's, it's useful to ask, you know, do, does the, do the research that we do, is it, is it important? And I, I genuinely believe that we don't know if the work that we do is important. We will likely die before knowing the answer to that question. However, I think the results are important because people who have cerebellar disease benefit from potassium channel blockers which appear to act not by changing the firing rates, but by changing the timing of spikes in the, in the cerebellum. So perhaps this work will have something to say about how to improve the state of cerebellar disease. Now, as you know, as neuroscientists, we're like explorers at the beach. There's this ocean of unknowns in front of us. So what we do is that we build a boat, we sail to some island, and try to explore it, and then tell the world what we found. Esson was the captain of our boat, and his destination was this beautiful island called the Marmoset Cerebellum, where he found these strange creatures called Purkinje cells, and what he did was to begin translating what they were trying to communicate. So I'll let him tell you about it. Thank you very much, Reza. <laughs> much appreciated. It's really hard to follow that. And before I start, let me just uh, do that. 
do this quickly. And also Shima can take care of this. Okay. Okay, cool. Let me share my screen and Okay, great. Uh, I think we're all set. Uh, again, thank you very much, Reza. And I want to thank everybody for coming this early in the morning. And I also want to thank uh, people around the world. And, and good afternoon to people that are joining us from Iran. Maybe good evening to people that are uh, joining from East Asia. I don't know if it, uh, we have anybody coming from East Asia, but um, so. And as Reza mentioned, my name is Hassan. I'm, I'm glad to host you here today. And the title of my dissertation was Adaptive Control of Saccades. And I was honored to have great scientists on my thesis committee. Of course, Reza uh, was my PhD ad is still my PhD advisor. Uh, I was really honored to have a Professor David Z uh, on my committee, a, a giant in the field of uh, saccades. And, uh, Professor Jeremiah Cohen and uh, Professor Abby, Abigail Persen from uh, University of Colorado, that their insights and helps, supports really helped me to navigate my dissertation. So today <clears throat> I'm going to cover a lot uh, and hopefully buckle up. So we are going to have a long journey together. And uh, I'm going to give you a quick introduction uh, about the saccades and, and, and why it's important to, to study them. Uh, I will, uh, give you a brief and touch a little bit of these projects. And the first project would be Sekad Bigger, second one, Sekad Adaptation, how we build our Marmoset lab, and uh, we develop PSORT. And then uh, having all this together, this Marmoset lab and this software, we recorded from cerebellum. And uh, by analyzing the data from Purkinje cells of the cerebellum, we were able to make a little bit of progress understanding how does this cerebral Purkinje cells contribute to the control of saccadic eye movements. And in, in the end, I will give you a very brief summary uh, about you know, these, these projects. So let's, let's start. And what I want you to do is just, let's do a very quick, simple experiment together. Uh, and it's very simple. Just uh, look at this black dot on the screen and try to follow the dot. So it's, it's, it was very, very simple. And um, it was just a dot and jumping uh, left and right on the screen. And if I ask you now that, um, what, what do you think was the behavior of your eye movements? If I measure your eye movement, how was your eye behaving in this situation? Probably most of you that are not familiar with the field of psychotic eye movement would say that your eyes were landing on the target that I was jumping, the, the target left and right. But if I actually measure your eye movements and show you your, the trajectory of your eye movements, you will see that your eyes were landing a little bit short on the target. And that's why we call in, in healthy subjects that eye movements are usually a little bit hypometric. So they will land short on the target. And there's always another and tiny eye movements that will follow that main eye movement that will correct uh, the little bit of error at the end of eye movements. Now, if we measured eye movements in a cerebellar patient, so this is a patient that have uh, degeneration along the dermis. Of course, other brain stem areas has also been affected. But what you can see here is that this patient is doing the same eye movements, but at the end of the eye movement, there is this jittery uh, things that happening in the end. So in the blue here, we can see a trajectory uh, of the eye movement for a healthy and uh, people that you can see the eyes are landing short from the target. Then there is a little bit of corrective eye movement. Again, the eye lands short, and then there is a correction. But for this patient, um, the eyes are overshooting the target, and then there is a couple of uh, corrections uh, to get it right. In this uh, direction that you saw, the left forward eye movements, um, there is multiple corrections, and this patient having a really hard time fixating at the target. So these patients uh, can initiate their eye movements, but they have a hard time and difficulty maintaining the endpoint accuracy of their eye movements. 
So, um, of course, our lab is not the first one that study eye movements and study of saccadic eye movements has been a, a big portion of the neuroscience and many labs have been contributed to the saccadic eye movement. As I mentioned, Professor Z here is, is a giant in the field and we really um, use his uh, book and his, his papers to uh, educate ourselves about the saccadic eye movements. But nevertheless, there is still a lot unknown as well. Although we know a lot, we also uh, do not know a lot. And, and pr probably the amount of that we don't know is, is much more than the amount that we know. Um, so in, in this dissertation, as Reza mentioned, uh, I looked at two things from the human psychophysics. I look at the reward prediction error and then uh, the concept of cost of error. And then we build this marmoset lab recorded from the cerebellar Purkinje cells and look how the cerebellar Purkinje cells contribute to the saccadic eye movements. So let me uh, go to the first project and explain what was the first project. Um, so movements in general, when we make a movement toward a rewarding target, uh, they usually exhibit a shorter reaction time, so they are faster. Uh, and this invigoration of the movement has been thought that uh, the release of dopamine before the movement is causing that invigoration. So uh, the idea here for the first experiment is that can we modulate this reward prediction error and can we modulate the release of dopamine before the movement and see how does this dopaminergic activity before a movement starts can affect the kinematics of that movement. So the task that we design and use uh, is as follows. So human participants are uh, participating in this study. So people will come to the lab, they uh, sit in front of a screen. Uh, so this, this indicates their eyes. And I ask the subjects um, to do similar things that you just did at the beginning of this talk to fix it on the center target. Then uh, we jump the target uh, to the left and right. So in this case, we jump the target to the right. In this case, instead of just having a, a, just a dot, we place a patch of a face uh, behind the dot as well. And there are two types of, uh, two categories of, of stimuli. We have face that is a more rewarding because it's more pleasant to look at face images. And then we have a noisy patches that you will just see in a second how they look like. And um, so the primary saccade will be toward the face or toward the nose. Uh, because we jumped the target, we asked the subjects to follow this uh, target. And of course, we'll start planning the eye movements uh, toward this target. Uh, what we did, the tweak of this experiment is that when we detect the onset of the saccade, uh, we will jump the target randomly again. So while the eye is on the fly, we will uh, jump the target randomly in one of four different directions, and also randomly will change the content of the image. So the uh, initial image was a face. It can stay as a face or it can change to a noisy image. Vice versa, if it is a noise, it can stay as a noise or change to a face image. Let's say randomly this task, this uh, specific trial will be a downward saccade, and the content and change from a face to a noise. And um, so of course the eye was on the fly when we did all of those things, the eye will land on the pre-planned location on the uh, initial location of the target. And uh, what will happen when the eye lands there is that the brain expects to receive that face image, that face match that we preview to the brain, but the, that image is no longer there, it's at the new location. So there are two things happening at the same time. First is that since we jumped the target, we ro relocated the target and we have the sensory prediction error, meaning that the, uh, there's a mismatch between the location of the uh, first image and the location of the second image. The second thing that happened is that there's also a change in the content of the image, meaning that I promised to give you a face, but now I'm, uh, I'm going to deliver you a noise. So there is a mismatch. And there is a, in this case, there's a reduction in the value of the image, meaning that I promised you a more valuable face rewarding thing, now I'm going to deliver a noise, meaning that there is a negative reward prediction error for this saccade. And so because we jumped the target, there is going to be a sec secondary saccade, like what you saw that um, normal people will have a secondary saccade. In this case, we uh, artificially impose a larger secondary saccade, but there is going to be a secondary saccade. But before this secondary saccade, now people have experienced a reward prediction error as well. So 
uh, people will make their secondary saccade, fixate at the target and, and see the noise. So we are going to look at two things. First is that when people make their primary saccade from the fixation dot to a face or noise, how does the content of face and noise will affect the kinematic of primary saccade? And secondly, when they make their secondary saccade, and how does the content, this change in content from face to noise, 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 uh, and noise phase is going to change the kinematic of secondary saccades. Let's look at the results. So first, let's look at primary saccades. What we saw is that this is a replication of previous studies is that the phase constantly and robustly have faster reaction times uh, when these primary saccades are towards face images. And uh, in addition to the reaction time, also the peak velocity is faster when they are toward face images. But more importantly, this is the innovation of this experiment is that when we look at the secondary saccades, we saw that there is an orderly fashion in, in the change in the kinematics of the eye movements, the secondary eye movements going from positive reward prediction error uh, to the negative reward prediction. And when we look at the uh, within subject difference in positive reward prediction and negative reward prediction, we saw a robust within subject change for this secondary saccade. Similarly, when we look at the reaction time of the secondary saccade, we saw again an orderly fashion of this uh, re uh, re reaction time for the secondary saccade within subject difference is also statistically significant. When we look at the peak velocity of secondary saccade, we saw an effect of reward, meaning that face patches have a faster peak velocity in noise package patches have a lower peak velocity, but we didn't see a statistically significant within subject difference for peak velocity, although we saw a robust change for the reaction time. Next, we looked at the change in primary saccade because we introduced sensory prediction error, so we expect to also have some learning. And when we look at the change in primary saccade, we saw that positive horizontal error, negative horizontal errors, positive vertical errors, negative vertical errors, all have a robust change in the uh, in primary saccades. So there, there's learning happening for all those directions. And also there is a, a change in learning uh, when we uh, people experience a positive reward prediction and negative reward prediction error, but we don't see a, a robust change uh, in or robust learning and robust um, difference within subject difference between positive reward prediction and negative reward prediction. Although it's in the right direction as we hypothesize, but it didn't meet the statistically significant threshold. So as an interim summary, we consider the effect of reward prediction as a strong modulator of dopaminergic activity. We found that Sekad bigger was affected in an orderly fashion by magnitude and direction of the RPE, meaning that most bigger Sekads followed the largest positive reward prediction errors and least bigger Sekads was followed by a negative RPE. As I show you, we didn't see a robust effect on learning. So in conclusion, uh, the conclusion of this project was that reward prediction and not reward per se modulated the vigor of saccades. Now let's move on to the uh, next uh, experiment. So we didn't see an effect on adaptation. Can we find something that will actually modulate the adaptation? If, if it is not RP, what can modulate the uh, learning? So as I mentioned, uh, and before our study, there were uh, other studies that looked at these implicit factors like reward and punishment and other things, monetary rewards, look how they modulate learning. But the result in the literature was inconsistent. So, we ask here is that, is there any implicit loss, an implicit thing that can modulate the learning from error? And so we designed an innovative and new task uh, that modulated, altered the cost of errors. And I will explain what, what do I mean by cost of error. And we ask, modulating this cost of error, can it uh, robustly modulate the adaptation or not? So the task design is as follows. Again, people will fix it at the center fixation point. And then we will again, jump the target. In this case, we're going to jump the target either to the left or right, 15 degrees. And again, people will initiate the primary eye movement. 
when we detect the uh, start of an eye movement, we are going to jump the target again. But in this case, instead of jumping the target randomly in one of four different directions, we are going to constantly uh, jump the target always inward. So there's going to be always an inward jump. So people will uh, finish their primary saccade. This time when we detect the offset of primary saccade, what we are going to do is that we are going to put a random motion discrimination task behind this dot. So in the previous experiment, we place phase patches and noise patches behind the dot. In this uh, experiment, we are going to put a random motion discrimination uh, behind these dots. And the heart of the experiment design is that we are also going to limit the available time that these patches are available on the screen. Meaning that when we detect the onset, this target appears, there's just 300 milliseconds and we start the timer for 300 milliseconds that this uh, patch is available on the screen. So. Now that we had the reaction time of this corrective saccade, this secondary saccade, this reaction time will actually eat time away from the available time that this target is available on the screen. So by the time that the uh, subject actually made the corrective eye movement and land on the target, there is not that much remain of that initial 300 millisecond. And soon uh, that initial 300 millisecond will finish. And two targets will appear on the screen for the subject to report their decision, either upward or downward. And with this, another, what we call a decision saccade, people will report their decision and receive an audio feedback about the correctness of their decision. Is, was it a correct eye movement and correct uh, decision or not? It, it would be a beep or a boop. And okay. So task design is we had two types of a stimuli. We had a high coherence that is easy to uh, understand which direction is this dots moving. And we have a low coherence and that is harder to understand and, and it's more challenging. There's always going to be a high coherence, small cost on one side of the screen and the low coherence, large cost on the other side of the screen. So let's look at the results. So we had a learning paradigm, meaning that people will start at the baseline and then we have the uh, perturbation trials. And so when we look at the uh, change in amplitude of, of primary saccade, what we saw is that people indeed express learning, meaning that they start at the baseline and then they start decreasing the amplitude of the primary saccade because it's a gain down adaptation. But more importantly, so this is the curve for a small cost. When we look at the curve for the large cost, what we saw is that the large cost of error, meaning that the target that has low coherence and uh, robustly uh, express more learning in the subject. We also did a second experiment that for the first part is identical to our first experiment and we replicated the results of the first experiment. So now let me show you why we call this a large cost and a, a small cost. So as people gain, uh, decrease their uh, amplitude of the saccade, meaning that they landed on the target uh, more accurately, they gain more time on the target. At the beginning of, of experiment, out of that 300 millisecond, they just gained uh, 150 millisecond on the target, but as they adapted more, and uh, they got more time on target. And by, by the end of adaptation, they get um, roughly close to 300 millisecond on the target. But more importantly for the large cost, since people learn more, they also gain more time on the target. And so how does this time on the target affected their performance during the decision-making task? For the small cost, meaning that for the target that is has high coherence, no matter if they have 150 millisecond on the target or 300 millisecond on the target, their performance during the task was around 95% uh, and up. But for the low coherence or the large cost, when they have 150 millisecond on the target, their performance was really low. And as they gained more and more time on the target, they were able to increase the accuracy of their, uh, the accuracy of their decision more and more. Meaning that this uh, 150 millisecond is really costly for them and they need to adapt faster to gain more time on the target to be able to improve their performance. So there is a large cost for this type of uh, stimulus, while for the other type, there is not that much uh, large cost. And this, the cost is basically a neutral. Next, we ask, uh, does this cost of error a causal effect on the learning? So can we modulate learning by changing the cost of error midway? So what we did is that in experiment one, 
we uh, again introduced adaptation and we looked at the plateaued learning, meaning that uh, how much they will learn uh, at, the, at the end of the day if, if we just keep them learning. And what we saw is that for the large class, indeed, there is higher plateaued learning uh, when we just put them in, in this stable environment. In the experiment two, uh, unbeknown uh, to the subjects, at the middle of the experiment, we just swapped the uh, side of the screen, meaning that the target that was high cost all of a sudden become low cost and vice versa for the other side. And what we saw is that switching the uh, cost uh, on, on the, at the middle of the experiment uh, has recovered the learning uh, for the target that was uh, lower, has lower plateau. It increased the plateau of the learning. So if I put them and put this curve and this curve together, you can see that if we don't switch the cost, we'll have a stable uh, plateaued learning. But when we switch the cost, we get a higher um, asymptotic learning at the end of the day. Um, so as an interim summary, in our task, movement error resulted in a corrective saccade, but those corrections took time away from the discrimination task. We altered the cost of error correction by using the coherence of images and investigated how the cost of error modulated motor adaptation. We found that increasing the cost of error increased the learning. And thus the conclusion is that the landscape of loss associated with the act of correcting for error regulates the rates of sensory motor learning. And um, so in the first project and the second project, we focus on uh, human psychophysics and we um, collected data from humans. Now uh, we were wondering, okay, how can, uh, what, what are the neural substrates for, for these phenomena that we are watching? Can we uh, record from uh, brain cells to uh, get a better insight about how does the brain actually do these uh, behaviors that uh, we are studying? So we focus on marmoset and monkeys and uh, we first built our animal lab. We first built the marmoset lab. We uh, develop a software and then we, having all this uh, now come together, we were able to uh, look at the uh, neural activity in, in cerebellar Purkinje cells. I will quickly walk you through uh, each of these phases. So for building the marmoset lab, uh, animal lesion studies and results from uh, cerebellar patients have established the cerebellum as being a main locus for control of the accuracy of the seconds. But how do the principal cells, Purkinje cells of the cerebellum actually contribute to the accuracy of the saccades? So we first introduced the marmoset monkeys as a new promising animal model and to study the motor control and motor learning, and in our case, uh, saccadic eye movements. So the animal setup that we built was, uh, we had them, uh, these beautiful creatures, marmoset monkeys sitting in their chair, and uh, they look at the screen in front of them, and uh, we had a similar pattern you will uh, see in the, uh, the fifth project, how was the task, but again, they will see the dots. We brought humans to the lab sitting in front of a screen. Now we had our uh, marmoset uh, sitting in front of a screen and watching uh, those dots moving on the screen. And um, so we have an eye camera that we track the eyes and uh, based on the location of the eye, we move the target on the screen. Uh, humans usually we will, um, kind of uh, bribe them, we will give them money to do the task for us. The monkeys do not uh, accept cash, but they really like food. So uh, we motivate the uh, marmoset by giving them food rewards and when they uh, do the task as we ask them to do. Uh, and while the animal is doing this task, we are recording from their brain. So we had a macro positioner to drive the electrode inside of the brain. We had a head stage that and uh, we record the signal that's coming out of the brain. We had a photodiode that uh, measures the screen response. And uh, lastly, we had a leak camera that measures the tongue movements of the animal while they're doing this task. Um, the first thing that we faced, the first challenge that we needed to solve was that we, as far as I know, we were the first lab to start recording from marmoset cerebral. And there were no uh, kind of, um, stable or, or uh, consensus about you know how to do this. So we had to basically solve the problem out ourselves. And the first problem was that how uh, should we target deep brain areas, cere cerebral areas in these marmoset animals? Um, so to solve this problem, what we did is that we started with a pre-operation MRI image. 
and also a pre-operation CT image. And based on these two images, we designed a subject-specific head post and we uh, went to the surgery, went to the OR, did the surgery, implanted the head post on these animals. Then we, after the surgery, then we did what we call a post-op, post-operation CT, and we use a CT ruler uh, during and this to overcome the artifacts. And then by co-registering all these three images, pre-op, MRI, pre-op CT, and post-op CT, we were able to register the, M, uh, the MRI image with the post-operation CT, meaning that with this, we can have the coordinate system of our chamber and we also can have uh, can mark different brain areas that we want to record from and have this uh, um, representation of these points in this channel coordinate system as well. So we effectively solve this problem to find the coordinate system of brain areas in the chamber that we have access to. So, okay, we know we have this information. How can we transfer this into reality or how does it uh, work in real life? Um, so we had this other piece that we called electrode alignment tool that we also custom designed. We installed it on the chamber. And then we align our uh, electrode holder to one of the trajectories that we want to choose and record from during that day. And then we remove the uh, alignment tool and uh, we remove the disc tubes out of the way we uh, install our electrode. And then we advance the electrode into the brain and start recording from the brain. So. Uh, how does it? How does the setup look like in reality? So here is a 3D printed skull of the marmoset monkey sitting in the chair, looking at the screen. We place the alignment tool. We place our rod. Then we align our electrode holder to this trajectory, and then we remove the. Uh, alignment tool, we remove the rod, we put our electrode, and now that this electrode is in the axis that we designed it to be, then we start using this marker position and we start to advance the electrode into the brain. This study has been has featured has been published in journal neurophysiology and has featured on the cover of the journal. This is a picture of Mirza, one of our uh, cute monkeys. We named her after Maria Mirza Khani, the first uh, woman who won the Fields Medal. And um, so. Uh, well, what are the interim summary from this project is that we introduced marmoset monkeys as a new animal model to study motor control and motor learning. We designed a precisely calibrated food regulation regime to uh, motivate animals. And for the sake of time, I didn't show you the exact uh, results for the food regulation regime. And we developed multi-channel recording system that enabled us to record from Purkinje cells simu simultaneously at the same time. And, and see how does this Purkinje cell contribute to the control of eye movements. Uh, next, let me uh, also introduce you to another challenge that we had to solve before getting to analyze the data. So the first part was just establishing the marmoset lab and being able to record from Purkinje cells. Okay, we had these Purkinje cells now, but once we had that, we uh, faced the, the next challenge, and that was solving the detection and attribution problem. And this problem has been a problem in the cerebellar neurophysiology field for a long time now. And I'm happy that uh, we were able to contribute a little bit, and there are more and more labs that started to using the P-Sort software that we develop in our lab. Um, so why is it so hard? Why was it a challenge in the field? And so I should first start with a little bit of background about the anatomy of the Purkinje cell. So this is a Purkinje cell. They have a very elaborated dendritic tree. Purkinje cells are very unique because they receive two types of input. They receive a climbing fiber input that will cause them to fire a complex spike. They also receive many parallel fiber inputs that and together they will cause the Purkinje cell to fire a simple spike. The challenging part is that based on the location that we record from these Purkinje cells, because we are doing extracellular recording, based on the location of the electrode with respect to the dendritic tree, the shape of simple spike may look like the other spikes in the brain, but the shape of complex spike changed drastically. And so when we are up in the dendritic tree, the complex spike might be a downgoing spike, as you can see here. As we come down and get closer to the soma, the shape can be an 
down, up going. And then if you are uh, close to the axon, the shape can be just um, some spikelets. So you can see that having a method that will capture all of these different shapes at the same time is, is, was and it still is uh, challenging. And indeed, in our data set, we also saw all flavors of complex spikes. And we had uh, spikes that have an LFP signature and upgoing. We had spikes that do not show any LFP signature and are just spikelets. And we have uh, complex spikes that have a downgoing LFP signature and the shape is a downgoing complex spike. As I mentioned, we developed this software and this is an open source software. So all labs is, is just open to public. They can download the source code and use it for free. And also um, by changing the source code and tailor the software toward their specific needs. And uh, how does the PSORT work is that it first start by dividing the signal into two bands, a high pass filter band and a low pass filter band. And then uh, using a, a Gaussian mixture model to um, adaptively uh, adjust the threshold for detecting the potential simple spike and complex spike. But where the PSORT shine is the um, lieu of um, tools that it provides for the user to correct the data and look at, uh, look, look at data from different perspectives and being able to find uh, what is noise and what is signal and be able to correct the data more accurately. And at the end, we provide uh, this uh, autocorrelogram and cross correlogram. We call them cross probability because it's in the probability domain and that will measure the goodness of a uh, sort. And as I mentioned, there are situations that we do not have an LFE signature. So in these cases, for example, here is an example uh, of such reporting that we do not have. And so the uh, red trace is basically flat um, while the uh, black trace is, is changing. So this is a complex spike. If we now uh, detect this complex spike, look at their shape, you can see the shape of complex spike is actually not that much different from the shape of simple spike. So how can we detect these signals that is different, but not really that much different. So we used, instead of using linear dimensionality reduction algorithm like PCA, uh, we use some uh, non-linear dimensionality reduction algorithm. In our case, we use UMAP and that showed a promising result. For example, here you can see how PCA and detected and complex bug, it's really overlapping. So we cannot really robustly detect complex bug, but using UMAP, we were able to uh, robustly detect the complex bugs. And when we look at the goodness of sort, and we saw that this is actually Actually indeed a really good uh, Purkinje cell that can be used in our studies. Um, so this study uh, has also been published in Journal of Neurophysiology and has been featured on the cover of the journal. This is our third monkey. This is Ada we and we named her after uh, Ada Lovelace. And that was the first woman who uh, basically was the first programmer. So our first programmer was also a woman. And so, um, but uh, this has been published um, just a couple of weeks ago uh, in October 2021. So we designed PSORT to solve the detection and attribution problem for uh, sorting complex and simple spike. PSORT made it possible to sort PSOLs with a wide range of complex spike waveform. We analyzed data recorded in three species, as you can see here, marmoset, macaques, and mice. I didn't show you uh, the data for all three species here. And we validated and compared our result with expert manual creation. And also we compared our result with state-of-the-art automatic spike sorters um, to make sure that what we detect is actually valid and correct. Okay, we did all of these things to get to the science part and that's the saccade encoding. Meaning that, okay, how does this Purkinje cells that now we have, we are confident that we are actually recording from them and we are confident that we sorted them correctly. So the base data is correct. So now let's analyze them and let's see how they contribute to the eye movements. And um, so what we saw is that, um, First of all, and um, let me give you a quick introduction. Um, so the information that the brain transmits from one region to another is often viewed as a firing rate. However, uh, when in the cerebellum, when the spikes get synchronized together, and they start entraining the nucleus neuron. So when Purkinje cells, so Purkinje cells are inhibitory neurons, they will inhibit the downstream and nucleus neurons. But when they get synchronized, they will actually start uh, 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 
causing a downstream neuron to fire instead of inhibiting that. So the question that we go after was that does the cerebellar cortex rely on a spike synchrony within population of Purkinje cells to convey information to the nucleus? Um, so again, uh, let's look at the anatomy. So we saw that Purkinje cells receive two types of in, uh, inputs, a climbing fiber input and a parafiber para input. But what is important is that Purkinje cells are not just uh, one cell sitting there by itself. It usually, um, there are clusters of Purkinje cells. And how do we define these clusters is that uh, one cluster will receive a shared input from an inferior olive neuron. So these cluster of Purkinje cell has a shared um, climbing fiber input. And this cluster also project uh, together to a downstream uh, nucleus neuron. The other thing is that there are a couple of codes uh, that have been established in the literature about how does the Purkinje cell act. Um, so since their act activity is an inhibitory, so when they fire, they will inhibit the downstream neuron. When they don't fire, they will disinhibit the downstream neuron. And the other code is that when they all of a sudden start firing, there is a rebound in the uh, deep cerebral nucleus. And of course, this is the most uh, interesting one is that when they synchronize the activity, they will start uh, entraining the uh, DCN neurons. So this is, this studies has been done in, in vitro, in a slice, in the dish. So how does it look like in actual brain when the animal in, in the context of behavior is doing the task? So um, David from our lab in 2015 published this uh, beautiful result saying that to address the first problem, uh, and the problem is how, how do we define the clusters of P-cells uh, because we don't have access to actually them uh, when they are in the brain. Um, we can look at the error and encoding of the error to define uh, the, the attribution problem. Um, but in his study, uh, he just looked at the inverter code. And it remained a puzzle that uh, do we also have a signatures of a rebound code and a synchrony code among Purkinje cells or not? I will uh, explain what David did and also uh, how we replicated that results and also what we found on top of that. So the task is again, a saccadic eye movement task. The animal, uh, we jump the target, the animal makes the first saccade. When we detect the saccade onset, we will jump the target again. And because we jump the target again, the animal uh, made the secondary saccade. And uh, here is the eye trajectory. And so the animal makes saccades in one of eight random directions and then a secondary saccade in one of eight random directions again. While the animal is doing this task, we're recording from um, Purkinje cells and um, we are recording from eye modulated cells in the cerebellar dermis. Uh, here is, I don't know if you can hear this. Uh, here is a sample recording. So here are the simple spike. And from time to time, you can see these and beautiful thunders that are happening in this range of, of simple spike. And um, so using PSORT, we were able to sort both simple spike, the asterisk show the complex spike that are happening. So we detected simple spikes and complex spike for these cells. So what is the challenge? What was so damn <laughs> uh, complicated about these Purkinje cells that um, just puzzled the, the community for a long time. So let me show you the activity of these cells during saccade. So here I'm showing you the saccade onset and saccade offset when the saccade ends. And here are a raster plot. So each dot represent when this, this um, Purkinje cell generated a simple spike. And here is the average activity for this Purkinje cell. And what you can see is that overall, this cell is pausing during the saccade during, but around the saccade is doing all these crazy other things. For example, in some direction, it is bursting, then have a long pause. In other direction, it's pausing first and then have a kind of sharp burst. So it's the activity of the cell is diverse in different directions. And it was uh, very challenging to understand uh, how can we make sense of this diverse activity. But because we are a developed PSOR and we are able to uh, 
robustly detect complex bug, we can also see the complex bug here. So first of all, you can see how sparse they are. So this each tiny red dot is a complex bug, and they are much, much, much sparser than the blue dots here. And, but what you can see here is that, for example, in this direction, the number of red dots are much larger than the number of red dots in this direction. So if you look at the probability of generating or getting a complex bug, for example, in this direction versus this direction, what we saw is that there is a tuning for this cell, meaning that this cell has a preferred direction for generating the complex bug. And we use this uh, to figure out how and uh, how to solve the clustering and attribution problem. Meaning that instead of uh, working with this uh, Cartesian coordinate system, right up, left, down, we transform our coordinate system to a complex bike based coordinate system. Meaning that we rotated everything and now we put the preferred direction at zero direction and we call this the CS on for that cell and then the rest has followed. Let me just explain this in, in, a, in a different uh, perspective. So we had different cells being recorded at the same time. And uh, not, not the same time, sorry, being recorded and separate from each other. So we had this cell that has an, an encoding for downward, another cell being recorded at another time that has encoding for the left part. So because these cells have different preferred directions, they don't belong to the same cluster. But if we artificially uh, rotate the coordinate system for each of these cells, then we can assume that, so we, we are uh, rotating the coordinate systems. Then now all of these cells have the same uh, CS tuning. So now we can assume that they are receiving the same climbing fiber input and belong to the same cluster. And as a result, they are also projecting to the same nucleus neuron. So when we look at the sum activity of these cells, we can see how they affect the downstream nucleus now. And just to reiterate, we use complex box just to change the coordinate system. We are interested in understanding the simplest spark activity. And so now let's look at the simplest spark activity, the ones that are really complex and we want to make sense of them. Again, uh, I showed you a cell that was just pausing and during the second and had a different activity for different directions. Now I'm going to show you different cells. So not all cells are pausing. Some cells are bursting during the second, some are bursting, pausing, pausing, bursting, and completely pausing during the second. And what is common between them is that usually, so this is the trajectory of a second. When the second finishes, these cells have a prolonged activity. They just keep firing for, for um, for a period of time. So the puzzle is how do they contribute to the endpoint accuracy of the eye movement if their activity is last uh, after the saccade offset. So we, again, we transferred the coordinate system. So instead of you, uh, looking at Cartesian coordinate system, we looked at the CS-based coordinate system. And this is the trajectory of the saccades. We recorded from 149 per Kinji cells. And what we saw is that the population activity of simple spike as a whole, and they showed a burst in activity before the saccade onset. Very interestingly, they showed the, um, we saw a pause in activity during the saccade that the end of the pause precisely predicted the end uh, of the saccades. And this effect was most prominent in direction CS180 and was less prominent in, in other directions. So this was the general effect. Does it also predict the kinematics of the eye movement? So if you look at different eye movements with different peak velocities, so these are different peak velocities. And what we saw is that uh, there is a linear encoding of the uh, peak velocity of the eye movement in the activity of these cells. And again, the most prominent direction was CS180 and going to other directions, CS on, and the effect uh, was less prominent. Going back to the beginning of this talk, um, so this is the inverter code, and we also saw a little bit of hint of a uh, rebound code here. But what about the synchrony code? Can we also tackle the synchrony code? Because we um, have full control over the marmoset setup and we use this state-of-the-art multi-channel recording in the Purkinje cell, we were able to record from multiple Purkinje cells simultaneously at the same time. So we can now look at the activity of the cell when they fire together at the same time. And what we saw is this. 
Uh, first, this is again a raster plot. You can see the average, the firing rate for the first cell and the second cell. Uh, we have the joint probability and then we have the chance level that's the independent probability. Our definition of synchrony is the joint probability of these two cells normalized by the chance or, or independent probability. Um, so how does the synchrony look like? So let's first look at, and the, again, the Sakai trajectory. So the zero is the acceleration onset, meaning the peak velocity happened here. And when we look at the simple spike activity, this is the same result and just a little bit shifted in time. We can see the peak uh, uh, firing rate before the saccade onset. And interestingly, the peak of pause happened right on the deceleration onset. This is the key now. When we look at the synchrony, what we saw was that during the, before the saccade onset, when the cell has the peak firing rate, and the synchrony is not different from the baseline. Um, but after the, uh, when the eye started to decelerate, that's when the synchrony go up. And that's uh, when we had the maximum synchrony. And uh, the second thing is that, again, we saw this orderly uh, modulation of the synchrony that, again, we had the most prominent synchrony in direction CS180 and a, a less synchrony in other directions. So as an interim summary, we use this hypothesis-driven transformation of the coordinate system uh, to uh, transform our data and make it so that they are belonging to the same cluster. And then using this, when we look at the activity of simple spikes and then synchrony among the single cancer recorded uh, per Kinji cells, what we saw is that before the saccade onset, we had the inverter code that will inhibit the downstream neuron. During the saccade, we had a rebound, we had a disinhibition that will cause the downstream neuron to start firing. And simultaneously with this rebound, we also saw an increase in the synchrony. So all these codes together work in tandem with each other to uh, make the downstream and deep cerebral nucleus neuron to fire during the saccade deceleration. So going back to the beginning of the talk, the, the patient have really hard time and difficulty maintaining the endpoint accuracy because the cerebral, uh, their cerebral was damaged. Uh, here we think that this is the way that the cerebral is actually contributing to that endpoint accuracy of the movement. Uh, let me quickly just overview what I presented to you. So uh, in the first project, uh, we uh, show that reward prediction error modulated uh, saccad vigor. This work has been published in Journal of Neuroscience in 2019. In the second project, we uh, found that cost of error regulates the rate of sensory motor learning. This recently has been published in uh, PNAS. Uh, third, and uh, we introduced marmoset monkeys as a new animal model to study motor control and motor learning. This work uh, has been published in, uh, and also featured on the cover of Journal of Neurophysiology. Uh, we developed PSORT software to address the challenges of uh, cerebellar neurophysiology. This has been published and featured on the cover of Journal of Neurophysiology in October 2021. And last but not least, and more importantly, we found that uh, synchronous spiking of cerebral Purkinje cells controlled the endpoint accuracy of the movements. This work is currently under review. Uh, let me finish with uh, this uh, Persian poet uh, from uh, uh, Persian poem from uh, Jale Esfani, a Persian poet. I will I'll read it in uh, Farsi and then I will give you a loose translation of it. So in Farsi, it reads as Zendegi Sahne Yektari Honarmandi Mos. Harkasi Nakme Hot Honada Sahne Ravat, Sahne Peva Sevijas, Horaman Nakme Kemardum Besparan Peyat. I'm, I'm going to butcher the, this poem, but it can loosely, loosely translate to life is a unique scene of art. You sing your song and depart. The scene is eternal. The best songs are the ones that stay in people's memories. And with that, I want to thank for your attention and answer your further questions. We will have a little bit of acknowledgement after the questions. Uh, thank you very much.
let me stop. So we had one. Any any questions? If you have questions, please unmute yourself and talk. Any question from audience? Uh, sure. <laughs> um, first of all, marvelous innovation, technical technology conceptually is spectacular. So the name of the game in making a saccade is to bring something to the phobia and as quickly as possible make a discrimination about whether you're going to fight or flee or embrace or whatever. So in, in all your work, did you ever look at pushing the, the subject to make a discrimination? And would that change bigger? Would that change adaptation? So if, for example, if you had to make a saccade to a target and you were given a limited amount of time by, by which you could discriminate what was there and the discrimination got progressively more difficult, uh, would that be a, a more natural way to, um, to test all these ideas about uh, adaptation, reward, prediction, error, et cetera? Uh, or have people done that? In other words, to really challenge the system to the max. So I cannot. Um, so in the second project, we actually did that. So we 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 tried to uh, inject that kind of uh, so the, the task is uh, important. Now the outcome of tasking is important, and by limiting that, we uh, made this sense of urgency, and and then. Uh, we think that this sense of urgency is, is the underlying mechanism for the brain that will actually modulate how it should learn from the uh, from from this error versus the other. Error. Meaning that not all errors are the same, and and what determines what how much I should what what should be my subjective value to this error is with respect to task outcome. Sometimes, uh, if the task outcome doesn't is not important or doesn't matter how much time I will get on the target, and it will have a neutral, just usual learning. But when we inject this urgency or inject this value to, to, the, to the target, then we start to see this affecting that there is a baseline mechanism for the brain, but there are these meta learning uh, mechanism that act on top of it and is modulating and the knobs today. Answer your question. Yeah, okay. So on, on that point, um, how tightly does the eye have to point right at the phobia versus, you know, these are, if you're a degree away, yeah. could, could, could that be a, a role in making the discrimination, forcing them to bring yeah. whatever image really onto the center of the uh, phobia? Yeah, I see, I see. So you're asking about the, the actual accuracy of the eye movements. Can, can we make the eyes more accurate? Uh, and well, accuracy, of course, depends how much accuracy needs depends upon the difficulty of the task. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so in our task, uh, we so th there are a little bit of technical difficulties there as well. Meaning that, uh, so in our task, for example, that the size of our targets was uh, three degrees or sometimes one and a half degree, and the reason for this is that the accuracy of the tracking of the target was. Uh, Half a point and uh, half a degree to one degree. So I just didn't have enough uh, measurement accuracy to be able to be confident that the, the eye is actually on the target within a democratic art range. Uh, so that was the reason why the target is large. But uh, overall, since people, I think that the purpose of adapting is to reduce that error and make the eye more accurate. So that's why the, the, the eyes will, will, will learn to adapt. But why the eye is hypometric, of course, there are uh, some uh, literature about that that's saying that, okay, that the first eye movement that you usually make is not accurate. They will land short on the target. And there's always, for example, for a 15 degree second, there is a one degree, uh, 0.75 degree error at the end of the uh, eye movement. Why? Why there is this error? Why cannot the brain just land on the target in the first place? And I think, and this, from what I understand from literature, that this is from the uh, basically uh, signal-dependent noise aspect of the eye, meaning that the the eye muscles 
as we make larger and larger cicads, they get more and more uncertain and more and more sparse. So by actually landing a little bit short and then making the correction at the end of the day, we'll have a more accurate and more and more accurate eye movement. So these are the, uh, the cost functions that the brain is optimizing and given the, the plant and then the, the muscles that it has to control. That's basically my understanding. Yeah, yeah. If you overshot some of the time and undershot some of the other time, those overshoots are going to take a lot longer yeah. to correct for. So you better just opt for the yeah. undershooting. Uh, but it also may depend upon natural behavior, since we usually move our head when we make. Yeah. So how's it? Are marmosets? Do they usually move their head? Naturally? Oh, of course, of course. So, uh, so it's a little artificial when we that's keep our head still yeah. as to. You know, inferring what happens in natural behavior. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. And uh, of course, marmosets are more dependent on the head movements and the eye movements because they're uh, for humans, the natural eye movement is uh, 10 to 15 degrees. Usually uh, for macaques, about the same range, 10 degrees. For marmoset, the natural eye movements are just five degrees. Uh, and then at most uh, six or seven degrees is the most because they most mostly rely on their head, head movements. But in, in our setup, since we are doing acute recording, we are right now head fixating the animals. So that's absolutely correct that uh, it's, it's with a grain of salt. This result is always with a grain of salt, but I think that's our best bet in going after. But we definitely can now improve our setup, go to a more natural setting, as you said, have a chronic recording and then record the eye movements. And of course, with the eye movements, we also have the challenge of actually recording the uh, eye location. And then eye tracking is also another challenge that in the head fix setup is more accurate to do the eye. I you're, you're good at overcoming technical objects. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully we'll get there. Hopefully we'll have these eye goggles for our tiny marmoset that will that will measure the eye movements and also do chronic recordings. And there's another question in the chat. Uh, and so Abigail asked, uh, how do you think the vigor information is communicated to the cerebellum through mossy fiber rates or neuromodulators? Answer to this question in form of walking several months to contrast that. Great, great question, Abigail. So, um, what we, uh, the, the way that we think there, there are two folds. First is the vigor of the cuts. That's the first project that we explained here. The second one is the cost of error. So, for the vigor of the saccades, and uh, I didn't show the results here, but we had this. Uh, basically, we think that this is the basal ganglia that uh, give input um, to the superior coeclus that when we had, when we want to make a saccade toward a more rewarding, in our case, phase, and there is a, this input to the, um, to the superior coeclus and that uh, will invigorate the saccade. But this invigoration will actually cause, uh, it will look like an error for the eye movement itself because it's, it's an extra push that and uh, maybe that the initial plan has not accounted for. So we think that uh, the copy of this, this supercolicolis to the brainstem will also uh, go to the cerebellum. And in the healthy uh, humans, when we have a more invigorated saccade, meaning that the peak velocity will go up, then the tail of the saccade will become shorter. And, and, and at the end of the day, the eye will land on the target. But if you do the same experiment with the cerebral patient and, uh, and Reza and David has already did that. When cerebellar patients make a saccade toward a more rewarding target, again, their peak velocity will go up because their parents and because the basal ganglia act normally. But what happening in those patients is that the saccades will actually start overshoot the target, meaning that because we had an extra, a, a little bit of boost in the peak velocity, the mechanism, the cerebellum that needed to come into play and then start accounting for this extra boost in the peak velocity will come short and it doesn't work as it intends to work. So the eyes will start overshooting. And of course, for those and bigger saccades, the eye will start undershooting because again, there's this damp on the target. So the tail should become larger and the cerebellum cannot do that in those patients. For the cost of error, we, we can speculate about the brainstem and, and the neural mechanism, but we really don't know. The way that we think about it, so it's a, it's a speculation again, is that we think this is an effect from the pupil air, 
pupil dilation and uh, data that this is uh, um, basically the activity of brain stem neuromodulators that will active that will and modulate the activity again on the superior colliculus. So when this encoding of the error get transmitted to the inferior olive from superior colliculus to inferior olive, we had a strong activity when we are dealing with the costly error and a little bit attenuated activity when we are dealing with uh, small errors. So the activity of superior colliculus again is the source of um, modulation of inferior olive activity and, and complex spike activity on, on the, uh, in the Purkinje cells that will cause learning. Uh, hopefully that answered your question. Okay, great. Uh, let me go to the uh, acknowledgements. I will be uh, more than happy to stay longer after, after the talk and then answer further questions. So, uh, okay, so acknowledgements. This is the fun part. Uh, so first of all, <laughs> I want to thank Reza and uh, my PI. And Reza is really, really, really great scientist, but he is not uh, just a great scientist. He's genuinely a nice person. Uh, he supported me when I came to US in 2015. I've been in his lab and since then, in more than six years now. I, I, I was one of the students that had the option to rotate in different labs. I did my first rotation in Reza's lab and I enjoyed that rotation so much that I didn't do any other rotation. I just stayed in the lab and then I was, uh, I was in the lab from the, from the day one, basically. Um, but Reza didn't just contribute to the science. And we, we go to his home. This is his mother, a very lovely person. And he supported us also, also and to the full extent. The other thing that I should highlight about Reza is that uh, he just don't um, brainstorm with us. He actually actively participated in all of our experiments. One of, so if you look at my papers, there's always 18 to 60 something years old. So that 60 something years old subject is Reza. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so he, he participated in, in not just my main experiment, in all of my pilot experiments as well. And, and the other thing is that when we build the Marmoset lab, like a graduate student, he sat with us and he recorded um, a handful of my cells. He, I think he um, just sorted more than half of my data set for me. So I should, um, so the, in the contribution of the papers and res as a graduate student did many of the work as well along with us. So I should, I should also acknowledge that as well. And the other <laughs> thing is, um, my amazing great lab mates. And so when I came here uh, uh, to US 2015, I was basically an immigrant here kind of, and, and Scott and Simon really helped me to get on board with the lab and everything. And uh, Scott specifically, I should highlight him because uh, we sat uh, side by side in the lab. We had a lot of, a lot of scientific discussions. He was a, a great person and helped me a lot. Uh, Woon Sok was the undergraduate student that helped me a lot with the data collection of the human subjects. Uh, Terim and Kave was also other PhD student in the lab. I should also highlight the contribution of Paul. You can see how strong he is. And, and so Paul really and uh, truly helped me build the Marmoset lab and get it off the ground at the beginning alongside and Kave. Tara was a master student at the time in the lab that has a critical vital role in training the animals and, and, and get the animal trains up and running. And Jay and uh, got added to the team later. And with Amy, they helped me uh, develop and make this piece sort of better software. I'll show you a picture of Amy in the next slide. Uh, my friends and, and have been my second family in Baltimore uh, throughout all these years. And when I came here, I think I was the, the first Iranian student after a couple of years. So there were not actually 
and that much big of a, a Persian community in, in the Baltimore area, and specifically in the in the BME department. But over the years, I we built a very small community of our own that enabled us to celebrate our, our traditions. This is a gathering that we had during the rules. Um, uh, I should mention uh, Sonia Mosen and 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 then of course uh, Chris Hamed. Hamed is here. Uh, here with us, and uh, Milad is here today with us, and Amin uh, has joined us. Uh, I've been working with Amin um, for, as I mentioned, to developing peace work. Um, but uh, he, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that he, or fortunate that he, he uh, finally got it to US and, and joined the lab. Um, I should also uh, mention, so this is a little bit of bitter and sweet. So. Um, with Iranian students, usually they have visa issues, so they cannot go back to Iran uh, once they enter U.S. So when I come to U.S. in 2000, 2015, it's been more than six years now that I have not gone back to Iran. So I have not visited my family all these years, and it was just uh, through the video chats. It's good that the technology has evolved that we can now uh, see them through video chat, but it's, it's, it will not be like having them in person and being greeting them in person. So uh, my father, my mother, and my father-in-law and my mother-in-law was our uh, great supporters. And, and these are my sisters and my uh, brother-in-law and my sister-in-law. I also should uh, want to highlight this. So this is one week before we got into the plane and, and come here. And back then, uh, my uh, grandmother from the father's side uh, was with us. And my grandmother was also, uh, she was with us. So uh, my grandmother died in 2016. Unfortunately, my uh, other grandmother also died last year due to COVID. And it was sad that I couldn't be in their funeral. It was a little hard, hard time for us. But anyway, we, we survived and, and, and we're going to thrive. This is a little bit of a twist. So, <laughs> uh, last year, 20, uh, in December, we added this new, uh, very fun family member to our uh, household. So, this is this is Fando, and, and this is our dog. And she is and has been a PhD. So, I'm, today, I'm trying to get my PhD. She has been a PhD from the beginning. And in her case, PhD stands for pretty happy dog. So <laughs> she has been a pretty happy dog and, and her happiness brought a lot of joy uh, for us. And I saved the best for the last and uh, I should greatly appreciate my beautiful wife, Shima. And um, she's also a PhD student at Hopkins. She's also studying the brain. And uh, we had this beautiful house and courtesy of Shima, of course, there's nothing of this is mine. Um, and, but if you come to our house and uh, you can see, although this is a beautiful house, uh, but it's a very nerdy, brainy household, meaning that we had a lot of discussions about the brain. And of course, through the years and through discussions with her, I was able to uh, navigate my PhD and get cons consultant from her and then basically uh, come this long together. So it's interesting that next week we are going to uh, celebrate our ninth uh, wedding anniversary. We have been together for a long time and we are going to uh, be together. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited to start the next chapter of my life, having Shima by my side and having this uh, foundation of support by my side. And uh, thank you very much again for your...